Hello, I'm Stan Grant. It's great to be with you. Joining me on the panel this evening, artificial intelligence expert Toby Walsh, Nobel laureate and ANU Vice-Chancellor Brian Schmidt, wildlife scientist and science communicator Vanessa Perotta, quantum physicist and innovator Michael Biersick, and international air quality expert Lydia Morawska, who helped highlight the airborne spread of COVID. And a little later, we'll be joined by astrophysicist Kirsten Back should be part of our discussion. The recent protests by construction workers have frustrated many Victorians. It seems to have been an excuse for violence and disorder and a display of toxic masculinity in its purest form. These protests are also potentially super spreader events. Is it fair that our healthcare workers will be expected to treat patients who've actively defied public health orders? And is it fair that hospital beds may be potentially taken away from those requiring acute care? How do we manage this violence and how do we manage the risk to the community? Brian Schmidt, I want to go to you first of all on this. I know you've written a lot about what you see as a increasing political populism, some of the fear and anxiety of this age and, and what drives this. When you look at these protests, what does it tell you? Well, it tells us that we do have a small part of the population of Australia that are fed up and uh, really aren't buying in, I think, to the Australian project. Uh, and so that is a problem. Uh, so education, I think, is really, really important, being able to have a conversation with people. But Australia, you know, as the population has made a decision of how to deal with COVID, not everyone is happy about it. But clearly violence that we have seen is not the right way. And we have made a decision as a population and our, and our politicians have on behalf of us to say this is not okay. And so I do think we need to clamp down on it. Uh, we need to find a way to get, of course, to being able to open up as fast as we can. But ultimately, we want to do it in a way that's safe and doesn't end up uh, killing or uh, making, I would say, really bad health outcomes for thousands upon thousands of Australians. Yeah, and Brian, you rightly point out that the small number, but of course, the violence that we've seen, um, the impact that that has is greater perhaps than the numbers themselves. And Vanessa, Brian said something interesting there and he talked about education, communication. There are people here apparently amongst the protesters who are anti-vaxxers, who in spite of the evidence, in spite of the arguments, simply don't believe it. How do you communicate a message to people right now who don't want to believe what they're told? Well, this is an incredibly tricky time for many people and whether you believe to, to be vaccinated or not, that's, that's your choice. The information is out there. However, the way in which we provide this information can be a little bit tricky and it's, it's, it's kind of time in Australia that we hit that refresh button on how we communicate in science and how we see science. And this might be one potential example, definitely one example of that. But maybe we need to think about assessing how we provide this information to different demographics and, 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 and provide that through people who they can relate to. So maybe there's a minority of people that they might look up to and they'll, they'll see someone and if they have those people providing those key messages, that might be one way. But there are so many and we are living in a one in 100 year event. Mm. This is very tricky, but communication is key. And the good thing is Australia is providing information on why we should get vaccinated and there is a lot of information thankfully coming from overseas I and mean, we've got the the luxury of seeing countries overseas testing people as well as vaccinating people and there's huge sample sizes that yeah. us in australia can look towards to see if these types of new science is working lydia when you look at a protest like that and we often hear um concern about what could be super spreader events we've seen other protests and they haven't turned out to be that, but what did you take away from these protests and what potential risks there may be, given that Victoria is still going through this outbreak of the Delta strain? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question and dip it depends whether there are infected people in the crowd or not. If there are and if there are others who are not wearing masks 
and they are in the proximity to those infected people, they have very high risk of being infected. So yes, potentially events like this can be super spreaders. On the other hand, we are talking about events in open air, in open air dilution of the mm. virus is much faster. So therefore, in general, outdoors, the risk is much lower than, uh, than indoors. Uh, and an infected person during, during a protest would potentially infect somebody next to that person, but not the whole crowd. It's mm. not like an indoor space where one infected person can in infect the whole crowd. So that's, that's yeah. the reason why we don't see this many outbreaks during the protest. Yeah, and just on that as well, ABC has been able to report that there was a man at the protests um, who has tested a positive. He's in hospital um, at the moment as well, just to go to that, that, uh, that, that issue that you raised there about someone potentially being infected. Well, there was one person there that we've been able to report who is infected. Um, Michael, Brian talked there about the Australian project um, and that people are not on board with the Australian project. But it does raise the question, and I think, you know, you're originally from the United States as well, what it raises questions about politics during this time and, and questions of personal liberty and freedom. I know in the United States, whether you wore a mask or not became a political statement. But when we talk about an Australian project, when we talk about a, a joint effort in dealing with a pandemic, there are other factors as well beyond the health factor that drive the sort of protests we've seen, aren't there? I, I mean, I broadly think so, but I, I do think it's worth saying that this is a really small part of the population. Mm. Broadly, people are on board, and the best way to know is to look at the vaccination rates. In New South Wales, we're now at 84% first dose, which indicates that 84% of adults are on board with this project. We really end up talking about a small but very loud minority. And, you know, to some of the earlier discussion, um, yes, there is a need for scientific discussion, for education, for communication. But at the end of the day, we, we end up with a, with a virulent minority of people who are uh, either by choice or by, you know, their wiring immune to fact. And so we need to take a different approach. And for them, I mean, I, my, my overall view of this is we are the victims of the greatest intelligence operation in history, that misinformation is being weaponized against us. Uh, it's not all that secret, in, in fact. Uh, and this is uh, fomenting violence in a really tiny part of our population. Our job is to help those who are mm. interested in hearing the truth and mock endlessly the people who are unwilling to embrace the truth. Toby, pandemics um, in the past have seen just the sort of events we're seeing now, aren't they? They've thrown up just these types of protests. Yeah, um, history is in some ways repeating itself. Um, if you go back to the 100 years to the Spanish flu, there were riots and protests then. People were upset about um, mandatory vaccines and, uh, and, the, and the lockdowns that happened then. So um, I do think actually there's a strange... A uh, cycle of history that these happen once every hundred years or so. Mm. It's just long enough for us to have forgotten the lessons we learned last time, the, the pains that we had to go through, um, the sacrifices we had to make. That was something that our great grandfathers, great grandmothers had to live through. And now we've forgotten those lessons and we have to learn those painfully enough. And, and Toby, given um, what we're on the cusp of as well with changes, rapid changes when it comes to things like artificial intelligence, <laughs> might this be the last of this type of pandemic that we live through? I'm hopeful that this actually might be the last pandemic because we now... It used to take a decade to develop a, a vaccine. Um, this vaccine took a year. Mm. And that's unprecedented. But now we can develop vaccines. I mean, some, some of these vaccines, like the mRNA vaccines, you can develop in a, a couple of months. Mm. And so if we can learn how to distribute the vaccines, and that's not just to us, but that's to the whole world, and we haven't worked that problem out, because this pandemic is not over by a long way, mm. because we haven't really begun to vaccinate the third world. And we can't breathe ca safely until everyone, everyone on the planet, has had the vac has had a chance at least to have a vaccination. Yeah. We're talking about boosters in some countries and other countries have not even had first shots yet. After proposing yet more cuts to courses and staffing, La Trobe University has this week announced that for anyone to be on campus from December, they need to be fully vaccinated. Could ensuring that universities provide COVID safe environments be a potential selling point for an industry that has been abandoned by federal government. Thank you. My name's Natasha Joyce. I'm from Bendigo in Victoria. Have a lovely day.
Thank you, Natasha. What a lovely message. <laughs> and, and Brian, I'll, I'll go to you on that. Where are you at at the moment on getting students back and having the right protocols and protections? Yeah, well, of course, we're in lockdown here in Canberra, and uh, I don't see that uh, changing for the rest of the semester. We have five weeks left. So we're surely trying to get our head around 2022. Of course, it's quite an uh, interesting vir uh, environment where I don't think anyone really knows for sure. But we're going through systematically looking at, for example, air quality in our classrooms, in our buildings, trying to assess this, because there really hasn't been a lot of regulation there. And there's a trade-off. Normally, if you vent uh, air into buildings, uh, they become less energy efficient, for example. So there's filters and things that are new technology we're going to have to look at. With respect to vaccination, uh, we need to make sure that the environment we provide on our campus is safe. It's not really, you know, it's not, it has to be safe to a, a standard. What, so does that, think what, what, what does that mean, though, Brian, if I could just come in there? Um, does that mean that you're going to... I mean, are, are your staff going to be... Uh, is it going to be mandatory for them to be vaccinated? Are you going to have to have critical levels of vaccination before you can open up to having certain numbers of students back? Where are you at in really benchmarking this? Yeah, I mean, it looks to me that we will be over 95% vaccinated, both within our staff and within our students, and we're going to be embedded in Canberra which is well on its way of also achieving over 95%. So at that point, uh, the modeling I have seen, but we need to keep on working on this as we understand uh, what's going on, indicates that requiring vaccination is not as important as probably other interventions we can do. But we're not gonna be able to just have a wide open campus, it looks like, for the foreseeable future. We're gonna have to have interventions with respect to air quality, masks, probably limits within rooms. Uh, and we're in the process of trying to understand exactly through the modeling, through our understanding of how this disease is progressing other ways, how we're going to run the campus next year. And that, 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 sounds, that sounds very open-ended, Brian. Um, it uh, is. So, so is this going to be more online teaching into next year? That changes the experience yeah. for, for the student? Are you looking at being the middle of next year, towards the end of next year? It just seems to be a very open-ended process. Well, my, my hope is, Stan, that we will have our campus open to staff and to students uh, next year uh, at the beginning of term, but we have to be honest that we uh, don't completely understand how this disease is evolving, uh, and there are going to be some restrictions. So my belief is we will be able to have uh, you know, classes largely on campus. There might be restrictions to class size. Uh, there may be a requirement for vaccination mm. in certain... Uh, situations where the health says we need to have it, uh, but we cannot put people at risk. And it's an evolving situation. We can see we're learning as we go. And so, absolutely, my intent is to have the, the, the campus open, but I don't think it will be absolutely like it was in 2019, I'm mm. afraid. I want to bring Kirsten Banks, who's just joined us now. And, Kirsten, that changes the nature of the experience, as I said, for both the student, for people working in the university as well. Um, what should we be looking at as we open up? The levels of exposure, the levels of risk, questions of ventilation, where do you sit on this? Look, I think the thing we need to keep in the forefront of our, our minds is to keep people safe. And keeping safe is keeping on top of things like exposure sites, making sure that people are vaccinated so that transmission is let down to a minimum. And look, I've been doing my PhD from home for half of the time I've been doing my PhD. Mm. I am really keen to get back into the <laughs> university. Uh, luckily, I'm in a field where I'm very privileged to be able to do that from home. As long as I have my laptop and a stable internet connection, I can do my research from home. But for many other researchers, that's been a very difficult time throughout these times where you cannot go to the university as they're shut down. They're completely mm. locked from people going and doing what they need to do to advance our knowledge in science. Vanessa's agreeing with that furiously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I work on whales as one of my primary species, and so it's li limited how you can get out to the ocean. We have to think about how we do things. People working in the laboratory, they have to change their whole way in which they may make, you know, assessments on certain bacterial cultures, that kind of thing. It changes a lot of things, and I feel really privileged to, and very fortunate, and I feel sorry for this next generation coming through in the PhD world right now. 
it's tricky because you don't have that face-to-face, -face, but also you can't go to international conferences. And the good thing is we've been able to adapt. And I think we need to look at the positives and adapting in this climate. We see parents teaching their children at home, and I'm sure a lot of teachers, parents rather, are appreciative of their teachers right now. We're living in different times, but we're, be we're adapting to it. And this is a good thing. We need to look at the positives. Yes, there are challenges, and I really do feel for those students going through these challenges. But out of this, we're, we're able to talk to each other in, remotely right now. People are watching us on devices in different parts of the world, but safe. Mm. And this is the main thing forward. So there's, there's some positives that come out of a bad situation. But we haven't addressed the other part of the question, which is how the universities have been abandoned. Mm. The, there was a recent study that said to May last this year, 40,000 jobs, one fifth of the workforce have, have gone because universities were denied job keeper, job seeker. That is something that we really have to worry about. Uh, universities are going to be driving the innovation that gets us out of, the, out of mm. this pandemic. The, they've been developing the vaccines. Um, what does that say to, about this country that we have there, there, there was a billion, There this? was a billion dollars in research um, uh, program support. Was that not enough? It's not enough because you know, all the overseas students weren't able to come. 40,000 jobs disappeared. To put that in context, uh, the coal industry, which we do seem to support, or politicians seem to support, employs 39,000 people. So that's more than the coal industry has disappeared. And that's that's a, a, a generational loss. It, it does raise the question too, Michael, and this has been raised before, that whether there was much reliance on money from overseas, to, which would ultimately go through to funding this, was as part of the model was there too much reliance on overseas students and overseas funding? Yeah, I, I have to say, so I'm, a, I'm an academic too, right, at the University of Sydney. I, I absolutely despise this question, right? Universities, not, not you, Stan, of course. Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be despised. <laughs> universities, like any other organization, respond to incentives, right? And they follow the pathways that are open to them. The government regulates universities in Australia. It's not like the US system where there are these private institutions that can, within some bounds, do have quite a lot of latitude. It's not the same here. You can't just raise fees uh, on your own. You can't just change student numbers on your own. Because of that, universities were forced into a circumstance where all the research funding was getting tighter and tighter. Uh, all these things called research infrastructure block grants that come on top of grants, they were all getting cut and cut and cut. And so what is the one lever that universities were left with it was undergraduate enrollments. And so they followed the incentives. They acted like good businesses, just like the government always asks for. And, you know, yes, something catastrophic has happened uh, to the market. But I mean, I, I wanted actually to come back to, to Brian's point earlier, and maybe I'll give you a, a little bit of a, a pointed response. We, yes, we talked about safety, and yes, we as academics want a safe work environment. We also want the institutions for which we work to speak up as leaders. So even though vaccination as a, as a mandate may not change things based on a 95% level and the amount of uh, other non-pharmaceutical interventions that are available, why not come out and say, as a scientifically driven, fact-based organization, we believe that vaccines are essential, except for those who have immunocompromised circumstances mm -hmm. and the like, right? Let's be leaders instead of always running and being afraid of, uh, of the politicians. Brian, just a quick response to that. Yeah, absolutely. Every time I talk to my staff, I say, get vaccinated. Mm. And uh, the question is, do I tell them because it's the right thing or to mandate do? mandate it. Or do I mandate it? And uh, that's, that's a really interesting, hard question. I'm going to try to get to the 99% level without mandating. And if I need to mandate, I will for health and safety reasons. Would you say mandate, Michael? I say mandate because it sends a message, not because I think people won't listen. AI has the potential to bring great benefits to society but the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights recently called for a moratorium of AI systems that threaten human rights. It seems to be that one of the biggest risks is the affront to human dignity if machines are given life and death decisions, for example, as with autonomy in weapons. What are your views on delegating life death decisions to machines and what can be done to address the development of lethal autonomous weapons? And indeed, we've already seen this, haven't we? We've seen increasing use of drones um, in warfare and we talk now about the emergence of the, the robot army that's going to change the very nature of warfare. We do, and it, it's a concern that I have. It's a concern that thousands of my colleagues, my, the majority of, of the people that I work with, share that we're entering a, a new revolution in warfare. I mean, the first revolution in warfare was the invention of of gunpowder, the second re revolution was the invention of nuclear weapons. This is the third revolution that will allow us to scale warfare 
do um, terrible, inhumane things. And so what, what you're talking about as well is that if we're talking about robot soldiers, these are indefatigable. They're not going to be fed, they can fight 24-7 and they're not going to make, if they're not programmed this way, not going to make human decisions. They're not. E ethical or compassionate decisions. They don't have our humanity. They don't, mm. don't ha have our conscience. They can't be punished. They can't be held accountable. It's, it's not Terminator. It's not some, you know, intelligent humanoid robot not with a red glint in its eye that Hollywood would have you believe. It's much simpler technologies. It's, it's things like, as you say, um, drones that, that are already being used in, mm. in uh, attack in Libya. And, and, and it's actually called, they use this phrase, don't they, a more humane warfare. They, they do, and, and it's, not, I'm not, it's not clear to me that it will be more humane. It will be a, perhaps a faster way to kill people, um, and they will do whatever you program them to do. Um, and previously, if you wanted to do harm, you had to persuade an army of people to do that. Um, but now you would just need one programmer. How do you feel, Michael, about the ethical decisions that we make? And it's not just, you know, we're talking about warfare here, but there are a whole lot of ethical questions around robots and and who, whether robots do harm to human beings. Isn't it the first, the first, the first law? law? That's right. Must not do harm. But in fact, we can't guarantee that. No, we can't guarantee that any technology that we build won't be used against us by artificial intelligence or by our adversaries in another country or our neighbours down the street. Um, it is a very challenging issue. And I think it will remain the subject of debate in perpetuity, right? How do, not only how do we uh, empower robots to make life and death decisions, whether it's uh, an autonomous drone that's going to have a strike on, on some target, or it's the Tesla on autopilot that decides if it's gonna kill you or it's gonna kill the, uh, uh, the group of, passenger, of uh, bystanders on the street. Um, you know, these, these issues are going to be persistent, but then it's going to be the question of how do we treat robots? Mm. Right? That's another ethical question. And uh, the, the point that I want to make is that this is not, in my view, unique. I think it is endemic to any advance in technology. We always have to ask ethical questions and we should always be asking questions and not looking at this as, as the, the one thing that breaks civilization. But we, we come back to the China question because yeah. China has made it very clear that they're seeking economic and military dominance by becoming a leader in AI. They're not, they're not announcing that they're going to build nuclear attack submarines. They're announcing that they're building um, underwater autonomous submarines. Mm. And, and away from, away from, uh, from warfare, um, you've said by 2050, if we're looking at a, a, a robot world, that you'll have a, a robot football team that will win the World Cup. I mean, it's not just warfare, but the way this changes everything in our lives. Yeah, it's hard to think of a part of our life that won't be touched by technology that can do um, smart things like this. Kirsten, just before we move on to our next question, um, th this question of, of ethics and robots, we're talking about warfare, we're talking about the more extreme, dramatic examples uh, of that. But there are simpler things. I remember one person once saying, why were all robots white? <laughs> um, why, why does Siri have a female voice? What values are we building into artificial intelligence? Do you think much about that or does that concern you? Well, when it comes to technology, I'm either really excited about it or really scared by it. Uh, the, the conversation that you were having before about having robots being able to fight 24-7, that is extremely concerning to me. Uh, but on the other hand, having a smartwatch on mm. my hand here, being able to track my health data, that is really fascinating to me. And so I think there are some really innovative ways that we can use AI for good in ways that are fun as well and engaging with not just scientists but also the general public. I'm told by 2050 as well that um, robots will read the news, but it's already happening. <laughs> Sam, I'll, I should just add to that as well. Another really good example that we're doing here in Australia is using... We're teaching computers to look for animals in, in animal trafficking. Unfortunately, wildlife trafficking mm. is a global problem and that's some of the work I'm currently working on. Using innovative technologies to teach computers that that's an animal, that's a lizard, we need to work complementary with people, there's the border force as well as sniffer dogs, that this is something we need to do to protect our natural biodiversity. And that's a great example. Hello, here's a question for Brian Schmidt. Do you think the expansion of the universe is accelerating because the rest of the universe is trying to get desperately away from planet Earth and from mankind and all its irrational behaviours? <laughs> they may be running from the robots as well, Brian. <laughs> 
Yes, well, sometimes I do ask that question myself. Uh, so, you know, the, the expansion of the universe, the actual expansion, uh, not the acceleration, the expansion uh, happened uh, because at the time of the Big Bang, the universe started expanding. And we don't really know why the Big Bang occurred, but 13.7 billion years ago, give or take 100 million years, uh, something happened, the universe was formed, started expanding. Now, what's really interesting is the... Uh, the, the discovery that I was part of in 1998 is that the universe is actually speeding up mm. because to speed up, something's got to be pushing on the universe. And that, that push, which we ascribe to what we call dark energy or what Einstein in 1917 uh, called the cosmological constant, energy that spread everywhere very finely in uh, the universe, kind of explains what we see, but we don't know why it is there. And so my hope but not yet realized, and probably not realized in my, my life, unless we get lucky, is understanding why the cosmological constant, why energy is thinly spread throughout, the spa uh, throughout space. And maybe that's a way of linking gravity and the quantum world uh, that we've been talking about here tonight. And it, it, it might be the sort of the answer to the biggest questions of physics that we have, is the theory of everything could emerge from that, but we're not there yet. We were talking about this before we came on and, um, and Toby and I uh, sort of asked the, the big question that's always asked this time, Kirsten, I'll put it to you. How can the universe expand when it's already infinite? This is quite the loaded question and something that I struggle to understand myself. So <laughs> thank you for putting me on my toes. Well, you're still doing your PhD, today. so we're, we're, we'll exactly. I'm still you. just a little baby researcher. Please be nice. Um, but it's it's definitely a mind-boggling thing to think that the universe is infinite, but also thinking it's expanding. The way that we understand the world around us is that if something expands, it must be expanding into something but that's not really the case with the universe as far as we know. We know that there is this Hubble bubble, which is honestly should be a bubblegum flavour, this Hubble <laughs> bubble of the observable universe that we can physically see. Beyond that, there is more space. That space is expanding away from us greater, at, greater than the speed of light, so we can no longer see those parts of space. And really, it's, it's just a lot. Mm. To put it frankly, it's a lot of space. And, and, and just quickly, to hurt our brains even more, um, Michael, there may not be more, one universe either. Multiple, yeah. at simultaneously. <laughs> you know, people love to, to talk about quantum physics, this discipline where I work. It's the small scale of things instead of the really big universe scale of things as, as really difficult to understand, as, as mind-boggling. I think that, that's the word. <laughs> that blew my... This idea that it's expand... The universe is expanding into nothing. Thing. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a professional physicist and I still cannot get my head around that. There, there's that famous Albert Einstein quote, the two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity. <laughs> I'm not sure about the universe. How do I become a wildlife scientist and what is your favourite animal? What's your favourite animal? Oh, I would have to say it's the whale and... <laughs> Because this is... I, I was hoping the kids would stay up late for this show right now. I'm sure they have. Thankfully, I've got Winston here. <laughs> and I just thought, why not bring a prop? It's a science show. This is how I communicate science. The whale is my favourite animal. They're big. In fact, being next to a whale in the water, you literally have to turn from one side to another. They're so big. They're as big as a bus. And if you're in a car and you look at your family-sized car, that's how big it's, their and babies are. But... To become a wildlife scientist and to do what I do, you need to be passionate, and I'm sure you do have passion. I'm sure the people watching this show are passionate about what they do. Doing something that you love is really important, and in Australia, to, to help foster that next generation for, for the jobs that don't even exist yet is something that's important. And to follow your passion and do something in terms of helping animals and saving whales by learning about them and learning about our environment is something that we can all contribute. And you don't have to be a marine scientist or a wildlife scientist to do that. We can all make changes at home every day. Don't pour chemicals down the drain. And, um, you know, make sure you throw your rubbish in a bin. But 
be proactive. The skills that you have at acquire at skill, yeah. uh, at school rather, or those jobs that you might have at a supermarket, these are all skills that you can take on board for the later future career of you becoming a wildlife scientist. And ask questions. <laughs> Talk to scientists. We're not scary. We're approachable. And <laughs> social media is. I can vouch great. for that. You've been very approachable. We have great Brian. shoes too. Come on. And great. We have great <laughs> and shoes. Great don't shoes. Don't here. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, um, I don't know if you've got a favourite animal, but you may have a future student there. Uh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was trying to think what animal uh, have I seen that I most want to be. I grew up in Alaska. Uh, so I've seen a lot of whales, but I like sea otters probably better than any other animal. So another sea mammal, uh, and I'm not just playing to the crowd here. Kirsten, a, a favourite animal and some advice from someone doing their PhD to someone who wants to be a scientist. Well, firstly, my favourite animal would have to be the cockatoo. They are so cheeky, but very, very <laughs> smart as well. But the thing that I would love to put forward to you is, and to all the kids watching today, is to follow your passions. And if you don't know what you want to do yet, try things. That was the advice that I was given on my first day of high school, is to try and take opportunities when they come. And Good that's advice. that's what's gotten me here today. Good so advice. keep following your dreams. A final word from you, Toby, in about 30 seconds or so. Well, my favourite animal still is humans, despite all our failings. <laughs> and despite I'm working on robots. <laughs> I'm still optimistic that, 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 that we have hope. Indeed, indeed we do. And we have hope because of the fantastic people we've been able to share this hour with and the incredible knowledge they've been able to share with us as well. That's all we have time for on our program this evening. Thanks again to our incredible panel, Toby Walsh, Brian Schmidt, Vanessa Perotta, Michael Biersick and Kirsten Banks. And thank you as well for all of your questions. Next week, David Spears is in the chair. He'll be live in Melbourne looking at the issue we did touch on a bit tonight, but one that's going to continue for all of us, the vexed issue of mandatory vaccination. And you can join me on Monday evening picking up our China conversation from earlier as well on our China Tonight program. Until then, have a fantastic night. Thanks for joining us.